Welcome to A Growing Concern. We have somebody here from Blue Mountains Biodiversity Project, and we're going to talk about uh, Eastern Oregon timber sales. But before we get to that, I want to just quickly mention BARC. Uh, it's BARC, we've had folks on many times from BARC, and uh, it's, a, it's a local organization that does the same things here on the west side of the mountain that uh, Karen Coulter here, who my guest is, does on the other side of the mountain. And the reason I want to mention BARC is I want folks to go on their website. If, if, if they're interested in forced issues and you continue watching the show, when you're done watching the show, get on over onto the website of BARC, and we've got a graphic for it, bark-out.org. And they just had a, a really bad decision come in by a, by a judge that uh, I don't think he knows what he's talking about on, on a, something called a jazz timber sale. It's like 2,000 acre timber sale in areas that are very, very prone to uh, landslide, very steep, very bad decision. And Bark has been fighting this. They've got thousands of hours of, um, of volunteer help going out to, uh, to uh, monitor the, the, uh, the timber sales and the units, I should say. And uh, some of it was even uh, logged really early, late last year when it wasn't supposed to. They got a special thing from the Forest Service to log whoever bought it. And uh, they managed to stop it at that point, and now it went before the judge, and, and uh, it, it's, it's a long, involved story, and I don't want to go into it here, because we've got a lot to talk about tonight, about the eastern side of the mountains. But folks can go on to uh, bark-out, bark-out.org, go to their website, I mean their uh, timber Excuse me, I'm looking at timber here. Go to their Facebook page, and uh, you can and look them up there, just uh, Facebook slash Bark. And uh, you can find out a little bit about this issue, and they're wanting letters to the editor. They're wanting folks to weigh in on that. And uh, we all need to stand up for, our, for our, our national forests. There's no business even being in there cutting. And maybe we'll talk about that in a little while if we have a little extra time. But for right now, welcome to the program, Karen. Thank you. Now, you, were on, uh, you. you were on April 4th in 2010. Mm -hmm. The show was put up on your website, and uh, we've got that website to put up here a few times as well. And before we get, just briefly before we get into your, your, uh, your slideshow, it's not a PowerPoint so much as a slideshow, uh, just a little bit of background, you know, how long has Blue Mountains Biodiversity Project been going, and what does it do? Blue Mountains Biodiversity Project uh, was founded in 1991, and we seek to address um, the root causes of ecological and community instability, and to restore and protect native wildlife, fish, soils, ecological integrity, and biodiversity in general in eastern Oregon. And we monitor four national forests in a BLM district. All right, so uh, whereas Bark is Mount Hood, National mm -hmm. Forest. You got what I'm from the pretty you, huge you, territory. Pretty huge territory. Now yeah. is that those four national forests, or do those pretty are all are those all there is in Eastern Oregon? No, there's other national forests, but we started out with one, then we found out that another one wasn't being handled very well, and then we found out that somebody stopped handling another one, and it grew to four. So which uh, four are they? So it's the Melhir, the Umatilla, the Ochico, and the Deschutes. So that's basically from Bend north, and I think something like that. Then uh, it's from Bend east to Burns, basically, right. and that and far then, south and, and north, uh, actually up into Washington State with the Umatilla. Oh, okay. And so you've been doing this since '91. Yeah. You, you yourself has been doing this since '91. Yeah. But it's a volunteer-based organization, and it's getting stronger and stronger that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, as is Bark. Mm -hmm. you know, so uh, I, I think that uh, there are a lot of there are some differences between you and Bark how you how you conduct your business, uh, uh, but uh, I know that Bark has members and and uh, it gets a lot of foundation money and I don't know if if you've I have gone great to, respect for Bark. Yeah, they have some really good people working with mm -hmm. Bark. Do you go down the same road with foundation money and members, or are you just basically just volunteers it's, and you just do uh, it? Well, we have to have funding too, so we're always looking for major donors and contributors and foundations as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it costs money to get out there. Yeah. You know, the, the Money's been scarce <laughs> the last scarce. few years. Yeah, yeah, ever since 2008, ever mm -hmm. since the, uh, the, the, the uh, I can't say that the, the uh, economy went bad. The economy was deliberately tanked. Mm -hmm. know, in my opinion, and we could probably get a, do a show on that as well. Yeah, I think we Because I know could. that you were with you were also with a program for program on corporations law and democracy. Law and democracy, and that you know democracy is it seems like it's dwindling with every with every oh, uh, yeah. uh, what do you call it with every uh, Supreme Court decision. We seem to lose yeah. a little bit more of it. Yeah, it's a th death of a thousand cuts here, and, and I, yeah. I think we're into about 500 of them by now. Yeah, I'm actually doing some videotaping for Move to Amend tomorrow. Uh, to get a 
constitutional amendment to abolish corporate personhood so that money is no longer considered speech and corporations are no longer considered uh, people mm -hmm. and don't have the rights of people when they aren't supposed to. Right. They have all the rights, but none of the responsibilities, right. it exactly. seems like. So, but, I, you know, I wouldn't mind getting into that sometime with yeah. you. But I know that... But, uh, uh, Polk Clad's an important organization, and there's a lot of organizations out there that are working on this issue. And it, you know, it isn't it isn't that tangential to what we're talking about either, because Not at it's, all. it's big money has a lot to do with with the um, with the, uh, the the timber companies and the and the uh, the, the companies that the, the control all the the uh, the agriculture and all, all the different things. It's all gets down to the the control by by the the, the ones that are they're, that are doing the resource extraction. Mm -hmm. And 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 unfortunately, uh, it's an uphill battle. Like I mentioned with bark, and these battles are probably never going to go away. Yeah. Well, we just have to do the best we can to adapt to changing conditions and develop new strategies. Sure. And. Uh, speak and get public pressure on it. Mm -hmm. Public pressure is what it takes. Yeah. And so speaking of that, uh, we can guess we can launch into what you've got going here. Okay. Well, B Blue Mountains Biodiversity Project is um, seeking to protect and restore native wildlife, fish, and plant species biodiversity and ecological integrity in the Blue Mountains region of Eastern Oregon. And as I said, w we cover four national forests in a BLM district. And these slides are mostly drawn from two timber sales. One is under the guise of restoration and has a restoration component, like most of the sales are said to have now, but it's actually got some pretty destructive logging planned in the big marsh timber sale in, right. in the Deschutes. So this is the first slide of the uh -huh. timber sale right here. Let, the, let them know they're in a control room that we're, yeah. we're moving into it here now. And so. then uh, the Wolf Collaborative timber sale too, and these, uh, there are billed as restoration projects, but they also have substantial logging involved of mature trees. Right. Well, before we get too far mm -hmm. into it, something I noticed right off the bat when I got involved in these issues is the is uh, the activists, forest activists, have been coming at the Forest Service for about 20 years, and you know they've changed their practices to some degree, but more than more than anything else, they've changed their language. <laughs> yeah, quite yeah, a bit. You know, they they use the word like restoration and, and right. all these different words that, uh, but they really haven't changed. But they're anything. still they're not, they're, not they're really still doing industrial logging and they're pushing to accelerate the pace and scale of logging dramatically, especially with Senator Wyden egging them on and right wing Congress. And also even scientists like Jerry Franklin and Norm Johnson uh, pushing for uh, cutting of larger trees faster, more, even though they're not that familiar with the scale of the destruction that's already happened in eastern Oregon. They haven't walked the ground quite like we have. Sure, and you know, you might mention you might mention it later, but Eastern Oregon, a lot less rain, things don't recover as quick. Yeah, thinner soils, a lot more difficulty recovering. Mm -hmm. So, shall I move into the first? I think slide? we should go. Okay. I'll let you move here. So, our mission includes addressing the root causes of ecological and community instability, which for us does include the exploitation of ecosystems and communities by large corporations, and the replacement of real democracy with corporate rule. And we monitor four national forests and a Bureau of Land Management District, uh, the Ochico, the Umatilla, the Malheur, and the Deschutes, and the Prineville BLM District. And I just want to point out that Eastern Oregon is very wild, with a very low human population and large expanses of public lands, from lower elevation high desert and dry ponderosa pine forest to moist mixed conifer forest and high mountain peaks. It, this it, is a big old growth juniper there. I was just going to ask, what is that? Remember, yeah, it's a juniper It's a juniper. Tree. Wow. Yeah, a very big one. All right. And there's rare wildlife species in eastern Oregon that need large blocks of undisturbed habitat like roadless areas, wilderness areas. We need more wilderness uh, because they require great distances to roam and scavenge such as uh, gray wolves, lynx, American marten, Pacific fisher, and wolverine. Mm -hmm. Wolverine can cover a single pair, 150 square miles or more for scavenging. And then birds needing old large trees uh, and snags include the pileated woodpecker, and this shows pi fresh pileated woodpecker foraging in a burned snag mm -hmm. that she's pointing to. And it also includes other uh, bird species, such as the white-headed woodpecker, which is shown here. 
And that's a male. He has a red spot on the back of his head, which is how I can that's tell. That's the woody woodpecker. Yeah, well, mm. no, the woody woodpecker is more the pileated, traditionally. Oh, okay. yeah. And also the northern goshawk needs large old trees. And there's also northern spotted owls in the eastern cascade as cascades of the Deschutes National Forest. So these are pretty much management indicator species for old um, forest. And in the case of the white-headed woodpecker for old ponderosa pine forest, in the case of the pileated uh, for more mixed conifer moister fir types. And then the goshawk needs more forest density, which is something the Forest Service is really going after, trying to log off a lot of the density. Under pretext of fire, probably. Right, and in some cases that makes more sense than others, where it's really dry ponderosa and pine and juniper, maybe they have a case, but they're also extending the same dry forest science to cover areas that really wasn't intended to cover, like moisture, mixed conifer, in higher elevation where there's more snow. And this is what it affects right here. Well, this is one of the things that affects. This is a red band trout. We need to protect critical habitat for bull trout, steelhead trout, and Chinook salmon, which are anadromous fish, and also interior uh, habitat for the red band trout. The red band trout is a more landlocked species, but the bull trout, the steelhead, and the Chinook salmon uh, all need protection from dams as well. And then this is a Columbia spotted frog. We need to protect habitat in ponds and marshes f as well, both from toxic herbicides, which uh, amphibians are very uh, sensitive to, as well as from logging impacts and especially from livestock impacts uh, on these ponds. Uh, we also have large herds of elk and deer uh, which need shelter from storms and heat through forest cover, which tends to get logged off, as well as pronghorns, which are an archaic species left over from prehistoric mammal times, and bighorn sheep, who need to be isolated from domestic sheep diseases. And Eastern Oregon is also home to hundreds of bird species and a great diversity of native plants due to the great variability in habitat niches. Some of the major accomplishments of Blue Mountains biodiversity over the past 23 years include stopping or significantly modifying thousands of acres of proposed timber sales, and some of our lawsuits have set important legal precedents that help other environmental groups. This is a big fire scar in an old growth ponderosa pine. This happens to be a snag, but you also see big fire scars like this in ponderosa pines that survived the fire. And then in 1992, we reduced one timber sale from 55 million board feet to only 5 million board feet with no appeal or, lit well, we did appeal, but with no litigation. That was during the Clinton era uh, when things were a little easier. And then in a later year, we stopped about 10,000 acres of logging with two lawsuits. And in 2013, we got about 3,600 acres of proposed logging dropped in four timber sales through appeal and objection negotiations, and we're still fighting two timber sales from 2012 and 2013 in court. We're also assisting scientists in petitioning for the uplisting of this species, the black-backed woodpecker. Uplisting mean? Uplisting under the Endangered Species Act for greater protection. In the eastern Cascades, this seems to be a subspecies of black-backed woodpecker, and it's more rare. And they don't fly that far, so due to the openness in between these forests, they don't actually reach the other populations. And this particular population in the eastern Cascade, like populations in South Dakota and California, appears to require uplisting. So we're one of the groups helping scientists with field evidence and, and records of timber sales that may threaten the species. So you would, go, you would go from like threatened to endangered is what you mean? Well, uplift, right now uplifting. it's not even listed as threatened. So I mean just so, to get it on the, on the board right, then. Right, right now it's a, depends on the forest, but it's a focal species or a management indicator species, but we think that that particular pop, population needs to be uplisted as a subgroup or a subspecies. And then often we're the only group or the most determined group in our area pushing for more protection for wildlife, streams, soils, rare plants, and forest ecological integrity in general. We have a biocentric focus where we don't value humans over the rest of species. We're also working to reduce the use of toxic herbicides and indiscriminate use of biocontrols. This is a Ceanothus silk moth caterpillar. In 2002, we stopped a biocontrol bio spraying project of BT 
over six national forests that would have killed all moths and butterflies in the larval stage in the area sprayed. So that would be cutting out a lot of biodiversity. So they were, they were spraying to kill one specific... They were spraying for Douglas for tussock moth, but it would have affected all the moths and butterflies in the larval stage at the time. But we stopped it with the lawsuit. Well, a lot of those uh, uh, butterflies and moths are uh, pollinators. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, and, and some of them are endangered, like this, this oh, species. Beautiful. This is a Fender's blue butterfly. I think I've seen these. Yeah, there's very rare, well, there's some lookalikes too, but there's oh, okay. some very rare butterflies out there that the Forest Service is starting to uh, talk about in their environmental assessments. Also in 2002, we stopped all the herbicide spraying on the Malheur National Forest with the lawsuit based on the claim that the Forest Service had not adequately prevented the introduction and dispersal of invasive exotic plants. And that led Region 6, um, the R Pacific Northwest region, uh, to actually create a new programmatic uh, e environmental impact statement to incorporate more uh, prevention of the dispersal and introduction of invasive plants so that herbicide use could be reduced over time. So we went from stopping the herbicide use on one forest uh, to uh, pushing the Forest Service into a new plan for all the eastern Oregon and um, northwest forests. And so now we're, we've since been commenting on and appealing separate national forest herbicide use plans under this Region 6 guidance because, uh, for one thing, we're very concerned about proposed toxic herbicide spraying in and next to streams, creeks, and rivers, as herbicides are toxic to fish, amphibians, and aquatic insects, as well as to neotropical songbirds. And so far, we've managed to reduce herbicide spraying on the Wallowa-Whitman National Forest from 11,000 acres to less than 1,000 acres. And we're appealing that part of the lawsuit that failed to protect rivers and streams from herbicide contamination. And we're currently working to improve the new Malheur Invasive Plant Management Plan. One critical area that needs our attention is Forest Service plans to spray herbicides on edible and medicinal plant gathering areas, including edible mushrooms like this hedgehog mushroom, uh, berries, and even indigenous people's cultural plant gathering areas. Uh, the Forest Service hasn't been um, having any prohibition on a toxic herbicide spraying of these areas where people actually get food and, and medicinal plants. And, they, and then they issue the permits to people to gather the food. Right, yeah, so this, this is of concern to uh, the big mushroom gathering industry in the Deschutes National Forest, mm -hmm. for instance. I'm surprised there's that much mushroom over there, as dry as it is. Oh, there's but a lot. Um, there's uh, matsutakis and morels and all kinds of things. Coral mushrooms even are gathered mm -hmm. uh, professionally or, or for a profit. We're trying to prevent toxic contaminations of streams like uh, Refrigerator Creek here on the Deschutes, but, this, but there's also cumulative impacts because this particular creek is also under threat from the Big Marsh Timber so Sale, which as I said is combined with the restoration uh, project in Big Marsh. So we're also getting, um, trying to get the Forest Service to set a definite timeline and benchmarks for ending herbicide use over time. New projects we're starting to include in, um, are challenging livestock grazing on public lands with appeals and possible litigation. This is an example of a stream. You remember what the last stream looked like. Here's a stream with no livestock grazing, right? It hasn't mm -hmm. been grazed for years on the Deschutes. Here's a stream with recent livestock grazing. So you can see the difference. Uh, in this stream on the Malheur, there's eroded banks introducing sediment into the stream, which can choke fish, and gets into their gills, and grazing has removed the plants all along the stream bed, including uh, riparian-associated plants or water-associated plants and shrubs. It should be practically covered over with shrubs. And those plants are needed both to stabilize the banks so they aren't eroded into the water, and also to keep the water temperatures cool for fish, because fish have limits on how warm the water can be. And even if fish don't live in that one, they live in the one that that runs into. Right, yeah, and so there's downstream impacts as well. We're also planning uh, local education outreach on the ecological role and value of returning wolves, which is uh, potentially not very popular with ranchers, but we plan to include information on how ranchers can protect their livestock from wolves without shooting wolves. And we're also planning to help pass the 2016 ballot initiative to end fur trapping on Oregon public lands. 
uh, just to help that along because we're afraid for one thing that endangered species and listed species like the lynx uh, would be trapped inadvertently and wolves as well and those populations really can't sustain that and we're just opposed to um, trapping for profit on public lands in general it's very cruel so we need uh, public support to protect biodiversity, ecological integrity, and the wildness of Eastern Oregon public lands. We're only a small grassroots organization in a re remote area, and we depend on public donations and volunteers to continue our work. Timber sales in Eastern Oregon have increased from two to 6,000 acres of commercial logging per sale to now four to 18,000 acres of commercial logging per sale. And the pace of logging is escalating and being pushed. Um, and this is largely with local public support from the timber industry, but also from mayors and county commissioners and local people who are concerned about job loss from the economic recession. However, this is an unsustainable scale and pace of logging for both the forest ecosystems and local community stability into the future. Uh, yet Senator Wyden and se scientists such as Jerry Franklin and Norm Johnson are pushing for further escalation of the pace and scale of logging and for increasing the size of the trees to be cut even though there's a region-wide deficit in trees over 20 inches in diameter due to past overlogging and continued overlogging in some places of large trees. Uh, so we're very concerned that they're pushing for the cutting of bigger trees when there's such a deficit and for an increased pace and scale of logging when ultimately the, the communities won't have jobs in the future if you just run out of everything that's of mature or commercial size. Um, We're already reaping that harvest right, right now. So. Yeah, and also the wildlife won't have much left. Um, the Forest Service is now targeting areas of density on the map. Uh, that were left dense for good reason, such as being northern goshawk habitat or being a riparian buffer or something like that. So we're very concerned that people are pushing this, including members of Congress, who aren't as familiar as we are on the ground with the scale of the destruction from what's already happened and how fragile this ecosystem is at this point. We need volunteers every summer to help us field check thousands of acres of proposed timber sales. Volunteers also help us do things like maintain our website, that's our website person right there out in the field, and solicit in-kind donations, set up paid speaking events and benefits, and respond to action alerts to send in comments to show public opposition to ecologically destructive agency projects. And you don't have the dense population density that we have no. over here, so that, that is really an so issue. So we need support from elsewhere, too, because there's a very low population of people in general in what Eastern Oregon. Is like, a, what, 100,000 people maybe at the most? Um, about 70 to 90,000, yeah, I think. So I can't remember like, exactly, but that's the biggest in yeah, the area. Like, the close. nearest town to me is 150. The biggest town in my county is 450, mm -hmm. so Bend is almost an anomaly. Yeah, and, and they're all probably not on your side. Yeah, well, it depends. So we train volunteers to fill out survey sheets on timber sale habitat conditions and to take photos, and to use these survey sheets and photos in our comments, appeals, negotiations, and potential litigation. And this gives us a lot more credibility with the public, the Forest Service, and the courts. Mm-hmm. And our knowledge of on-the-ground conditions is fairly unique. Uh, we train volunteers in wildlife and plant identification, forest and fire ecology, and map and compass orient orienteering. And the reason I say it's fairly unique is we're the only organization out there uh, that actually tries to get to every single sale unit that involves commercial logging on, on thousands of acres of timber sales every summer over four national forests. I know the bark gets out. Um, but they're just dealing with one, so mm -hmm. so we're covering a lot of ground. So you say these these trainings? Do you uh, you able to work with any of the schools to give some kind of a, a school credit for any of this stuff? Uh, people sometimes do? people get school credit. We had a high school student from Nova High School, Alternative High School in Seattle, get school credit. We've had people from Evergreen State College get credit. Uh, we don't have the capacity to have done as much outreach to schools as we've liked, but we've had people come out with us anywhere from 12 years old to up in their 60s. And mm -hmm. so it just depends on who's interested. Sure. Well, that's, you know, that's a way people out there in the, in the audience can help. If, they, if yeah. they're a teacher or something, they may be able to. Oh, yeah, I'd love to present to more classes. I, I do, I'm presenting to um, Portland State University class, social movements class soon, and love to do more. 
And we hope that people will help us in general. Um, we also have uh, volunteer law students helping us write appeals and objections and lawyers volunteering some of their time to bring our cases to court. And we camp and eat together in proposed timber sales and hike proposed timber sale areas measuring trees, stream buffers, canopy closure, and slope steepness, as well as identifying tree species composition and habitat conditions. And this is one of our volunteers ex exulting over a big lightning scar and a live old growth tree. So we hope people will help us however they can in the forest or from the city. Uh, to volunteer or donate, uh, check out our website at Blue Mountains Biodiversity Project, and Mountains is abbreviated MTNS, and it's Blue Mountains Biodiversity Project .org, or call us at 541 385 9167. All right, was that all of your yeah, slides? Yeah, that's all the slides. Yeah, we, uh, we can put that graphic up. We didn't get your phone number up for your for your uh, website, but there we go. Yeah, it, the phone number is 541-385-9167, and that can be used to call to volunteer or else to call to find out how to donate. Mm -hmm. And you can also donate directly through our website as well, electronically. All right, there's, there's, there's so many ways, you know, I mean, donations are important, but, you know, there's so many ways that people can help out, that mm -hmm. like, you know, the teachers can do this, can, can help out, you can, you know, People may not have a month free or, yeah. you know, uh, two weeks free to get over there, but there are other ways to help out. And, yeah. uh, and uh, just test telling, telling people that you meet that there's something going on across the mountain because, you know, out of sight, out of mind, there's not that many people that are aware of that what's going on over there. And, and I think the timber sales are bigger. And are they still clear-cutting over there? Uh, they're trying to get more clear-cutting done on lodgepole pine in particular, especially in the Deschutes. Uh, so, yeah, there's moves to cut more heavily and to cut ol larger trees than have been cut for a while. Uh, there was a 21 inch limit, there is a 21 inch limit on logging live trees that are not uh, safety hazard trees like OSHA hazard trees. Uh, but the Forest Service, uh, with the pushing uh, of the timber industry in local communities, is, uh, keeps trying to violate that limit even though they, they have a forest plan revision in the works. I don't know why our government passes laws because they just turn around and, and negate them it seems like in yeah. so many ways it just you know congress is doing it all the time they pass a law and they just oh well we can go around it yeah Doesn't they say it's fine because it's a forest plan amendment but the problem is that when they do this on forest after forest project after project it's cumulatively significant so it, it means mooting that uh forest plan standard essentially mm -hmm. and that cumulative is an important an important word too because that's what i've noticed with bark is the forest service and then blm they don't take into consideration quite often when they plan these timber sales the cumulative effects of what's right. already gone on in the area yeah and quite often an environmental assessment or an environmental impact statement will only look at that project area and derive their assessment of the impacts to the wildlife only from that project area, even though there may be projects adjacent to it or nearby that have already been logged heavily and where that species has already suffered. Sure, and you know, you got an area that's, that's fairly pristine and maybe hasn't been logged in, in you know, a couple, three generations or whatever. That, that is the safe harbor for all the critters that uh, escaped the logging that was going on around it. Then they go in there and cut that. Yeah, and right now the Blue Mountains Forest Plan revisions are underway and are up for comment. And so people should contact me about that too. If they want to get on our email action alert, uh, they can uh, check out our website and um, co or communicate with me by phone to get on that action alert uh, list. And then if they can't make it out to the forest, they can write comments and show public opposition. In the case of the Blue Mountain Forest Plan revision, it affects the Umatilla, the Malheur, and the Willow Whitman National Forests. So all three forest plans would change at once because they're outdated forest plans. But the problem is they're thinking of scrapping the 21-inch limit, even though there continues to be a deficit in large trees from all the logging. It hasn't recovered yet. And they're also making other changes. Um, so we're, we do have an action alert that we can send people on that. Uh, to try to push them in the right direction. Alternative C looks like the best alternative they're offering, but I'd like to see it even better than that, more protective. Yeah. For one thing, um, the forest plan revision is the stage at which they decide what amount of potential wilderness areas will be um, 
recommended by the Forest Service to Congress for designation as wilderness, and they have one alternative where that would be zero. Alternative C would be around 500,000 acres, and then the preferred alternative would only be about 91,000 acres. So that's a huge difference, especially when you consider that conservation biologists have said that major keystone species like grizzly bears, which aren't here, but gray wolves, which are, and others like that, uh, they don't have enough habitat now that's protected to go into future generations as a viable species. And that may be true of bison, uh, for instance, with the Yellowstone situation as well. Uh, so we have to start setting aside more wild areas to have a full complement of species. And, sure. and get back to a biocentric ethic where we recognize that humans should not be the center of the universe, that we're causing far too much damage the way we're operating now, and we need to have reverence for nature, which supports all of us. Mm -hmm. And not only have wilderness areas, but fairly good size, not just, Very a, bunch big of, ones, yeah. not just a bunch of little ones, yeah. which are <clears throat> almost like no good at all. Yeah, you, you have to have connectivity of the wild areas for a lot of these species to survive. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned a couple words here, <clears throat> keystone and indicator. Mm -hmm. And uh, indicator species is like the um, spotted owl. It indicates the health of the forest. Mm -hmm. What is keystone? Uh, boy, I wish I was better at defining that, but a keystone species is like a grizzly bear or a wolf, something that's on the apex of the food chain where we don't even know what all the effects would be of removing that species. Uh, so keystone in the sense of holding it together. Uh, oh, okay. For instance, these are species that do not reproduce very fast and can be taken out pretty quickly uh, by, by negative impacts. And mm -hmm. so we need to keep ecological functioning together because e ecology is a series of interwoven tightly woven uh, niches or webs, like ecological webs of food webs and so forth. And if you tinker with one part, you don't know what you're doing to another part. And it's really fascinating, actually. I'm going to the Cascadia Confluence uh, this weekend and presenting on biocentrism and deep ecology. And when you go out in the field the way we do, you see really interesting things that we then learn about. For instance, that fungi or mushrooms indicate um, different tree species. They have associations with different tree spe species, as do saprophytic plants or plants without chlorophyll. And some of the saprophytic plants indicate what fungi might be there. So there's all kinds of mysterious interconnections that we don't, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We can't pretend to know what we're messing up when mm. we do such grave and extensive damage to the ecosystem. And, and the Forest Service and the BLM don't even acknowledge that those, those relationships even exist. Well, sometimes they acknowledge it. I mean, it's uh, pretty hard to miss the uh, mycorrhizal fungi are important to tree health. Finally, yeah. But <laughs> they log and destroy mycorrhizal fungi with heavy logging anyway. Mm -hmm. So they may acknowledge it in, say, an environmental assessment, but then ignore it on the ground, depending on the district, depending on the forest. I mean, they're all different. I think that was a lot of what was going on with one of the recent timber sales that uh, the uh, bark was going up against was that they were there was I forget the details of it but there was they they were taking out so many snags yeah and they were saying they they were saying on paper that uh, this is going against what we're supposed to do but we're going to do it anyway yeah basically they were violating their forest plan st standards for how many snags needed to be in the area. And they said, well, there's so few snags that they can't really support much anyway. And these were really big old growth trees, apparently big old growth snags, which are very valuable for carbon storage, for wildlife habitat, for soil nutrient mm -hmm. recycling later, uh, for all kinds of things. And yet the ar legal argument is, well, just because there's few and you're already below the level, why does that give you permission to get rid of the, rest, rid of of the rest of it? And so quite often the Forest Service makes arguments like that. Yeah, yeah. I bring that up just, just to demonstrate the, the mentality, mm -hmm. you know, that, that yeah. uh, the folks such as yourself and Bark are up against. Yeah. Where they think, oh, well, we can't do it right, so we're just going to do away with it. Right. And, and, and that, that, that type of mentality is, is, is demonstrated in many different ways. One thing that really concerns me about the forest plan revision is it's building on uh, pretty unfortunate legal precedents right now uh, that give the Forest Service deference to not only on a lot of decisions, which is not very helpful for protecting the environment, but also uh, to use habitat as a surrogate for doing population studies of management indicator species. So they say, well, there's all this suitable habitat out there 
So the species are fine, but they're not doing population studies to see if the species is even in that habitat, uh, if they're being reproductively successful, if they're declining, what their viability threshold is, none of that. You have to do population surveys. I mean, any biologist would tell you that unless they were paid by an agency or something maybe. Uh, and you can't determine viability thresholds and population status and trends without studying the population. But they're getting off the hook, not studying the population. And what I've started to see lately in the environmental impact statements and assessments is where they're grossly inflating the amount of suitable habitat. For instance, a species that needs snags, they're not looking at whether it's a sufficient number of snags or a species that needs density, they're not looking at that. And so these species may be occupying only a very small part of what they say is suitable habitat, or they may not be there at all, in which case we need to start worrying about how they're doing out there. Mm -hmm. Sure. Now, just kind of an aside, what was this Cascadia confluence? Is that some kind yeah, of... Yeah, it's this weekend at Portland State University in the Smith Memorial Union, and it's happening Saturday and Sunday, and it's focusing on bioregionalism, and in the case of the workshop that I'm doing with my friend, um, uh, 3 o'clock on Sunday, we're focusing on biocentrism and deep ecology, and I'll have a different PowerPoint from Eastern Oregon All for that right. one. All right. I haven't. I don't know how man is not to hear about this, but uh, this hasn't been listed anywhere now. Is there a website, Cascadia Confluence? Maybe? Unfortunately, I don't have it on me. I don't know. But there is a website. You can probably uh, probably just Google Cascadia. A Cascadia Confluence. You could Confluence, probably find you it. You can yeah. probably find. I looked that up. I'm pretty. And it's at up. Portland State University Saturday and Sunday. All right. There should be some uh, as well as the one that you're given. There should be some really good, mm -hmm. good uh, panels and workshops on there. Another thing I should announce is. Uh, Another really significant impact that humans have to the ecosystems is now on a global scale with catastrophic climate change, which of course uh, logging bigger trees gets rid of a lot of carbon storage that would otherwise help slow climate change, which is one of our concerns with the forest. But here in Portland, we're lucky to have Portland Rising Tide, which is an all-volunteer part of an international movement called Rising Tide. And they're doing an action on April 28th that's open to the public. And people are asked to meet at Terry Shrunk Park at noon on April 28th. I have a flyer for it. This there is not is. just local either. This is, this, is, this is part of a global climate convergence, 10 days of action on the climate. And it's Monday, April 28th at Terry Shrunk Plaza, which is at Southwest 3rd and Madison downtown. Starts at noon. That's where we're gathering. And basically, it's action against fossil fuel exports because Governor Kitzhaber has been uh, allowing DEQ, and DEQ has been issuing permits, uh, things like coal export and oil terminals. Uh, so we're asking people to join us for mass action in downtown Portland and to highlight the farce of regulatory agencies that work hand in hand with the fossil fuel industry. Uh, and yeah. you can get more information on that at portlandrisingtide.org. And there's also a Facebook page, um, PDX Rising Tide. And there's also an, um, a website, globalclimateconvergence.org. Okay. So that, you know, that, uh, that I'm glad to hear about this Cascadia confluence. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think that, uh, I think he was wanting to get a shot of this, but it's pretty small here. Uh, you could try it. It's right here. All right, yeah. and get that up so people yeah. can see this that. This is on the um, action on April 28th with Portland Rising Tide. And Portland Rising Tide is really fun. It does a lot of um, fun street theater kind of actions and really does have a cumulative effect along with other people's efforts and other groups' efforts mm -hmm. on trying to get political will to, to start slowing down the fossil fuel industry, um, leaving stuff in the ground, and addressing climate change. All right. I guess he's, he got mm -hmm. that, got enough of that. So, well, it's, I'm glad you brought that up too. Thanks for doing that. There. Thank you. Uh, um, because you know you think about so much of what uh, Portland Rising Tide and other organizations, 350 PDX350.org, and all that are doing, and you know, are de dealing with energy. But at the same time, you know what you're doing, what Bark's doing, and, and the people that are out there in the forest trying to, to, to stop the logging. It, 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 it's a climate issue too. Oh yeah, you and, know, and, and I'm we glad can't. You brought that up. And we can't stop all this without the public getting involved on a big, in a big way, especially things as major as climate change. Uh, mm -hmm. We need everybody helping in whatever way they can. Well, now you, you mentioned that the big trees they they they, uh, 
they, they, I don't know, you call them carbon sinks or, you know, they say Carbon what? storage and carbon, carbon storage, sequestration, right. yeah. But at the same time, when you cut them down, and then you're cutting down a lot of other uh, smaller brush and different things that they are, they are breathing in carbon dioxide and exhaling oxygen. Mm -hmm. um, the whole thing is, it, that, that whole process is, is and isn't just a tree itself, but the whole process of logging. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, the Forest Service in Eastern Oregon, where there's a lot of wildfires, naturally, it's a fire adapted ecosystem, tends to say, well, if we don't log it, uh, or thin it, I mean, some are more legitimate than others, you know, removing just small trees versus big trees, then wildfire will come along and contribute more to climate change, but actually there's studies showing that the logging is contributing more as a net result to climate change than fire, and if you think about it, a lot of the biomass stays with fire. It either returns to the ground as ash or is left as dead snags and down logs, whereas uh, logging artificially removes biomass and carbon storage mm -hmm. and uses it up fairly quickly usually with products. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what you were talking about the, about the, uh, something a little while ago, I, re I realized that uh, there was something just recently on uh, OPB that, that the, um, they completely killed off the, the wolves in Yellowstone mm -hmm. and uh, they just recently reintroduced them, and when they reintroduced them, I guess it's a keystone species. Mm -hmm. You know, they kept the the elk at bay from the creeks and, and from the aspen and, and the aspen and the willows, mm -hmm. and they started growing up and they started right. covering over the creeks. And that's exactly what you were talking and about. And that's there. that's one reason we want that keystone species, the gray wolf, back in eastern Oregon because it will help keep that kind of balance, where it, w it keeps the elk moving. moving and keeps them off the willows and the aspen. Of course, we have to deal with the cattle and sheep as well, uh, munching down the willows and aspen and destroying mm -hmm. the creeks. But getting wolves back would be a big step in returning the integrity of that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you mentioned that grazing because I, I wasn't paying much attention to this, but then uh, Rachel Maddow got into a, I guess she talked for like 25 minutes. The rest of the show must have been commercials, but she went 25 minutes of what was going on in Utah on this big armed thing again mm -hmm. the, against the BLM, uh, local people against the BLM because they were they wanted their freedoms. Basically, they want, what the freedom they wanted was to continue getting uh, grazing rights for, mm -hmm. what is it, 10 cents on the dollar or something like that? I forget what it's, the... It's very low it's, compared to they, market they rate. They pay very little, and I guess the government was going to stop doing that. And they grabbed their guns, and they were going to go to war. Mm -hmm. and, I've heard of that, yeah. And, yeah, and it was uh, that she went into it pretty adept. And, uh, of course, they went at war. They, they squared off against the, uh, the, the federal people, and uh, they were here, and the federal people were there. But then they sent all their wives and children and things right down in between them. So, of course, the wow. federals backed off. Yeah, well, in you eastern know. Oregon, we're, we're starting to work more on grazing issues, as I said. And we make a distinction between different kinds of ranchers, of course, because some are really not controlling the grazing at all or are violating the grazing standards or letting their cows stay out too long or whatever. Others are really trying uh, to make it work and are willing to accept measures to protect the fish and so forth. So there are distinctions. However, when everything is said and done, Cattle and sheep are an exotic species on a very fragile, high desert type of landscape. Mm -hmm. And this isn't necessarily the base, best grazing habitat either. I mean, quite often it's very mm -hmm. marginal. And it's only a minority of ranchers that use uh, public lands as allotments. Uh, and they're heavily subsidized. So the whole system needs to be looked at and uh, hopefully we can transition it so that vacant allotments stay a vacant um, ranchers who are violating the riparian standards and aren't bringing it back up uh, to standard, uh, those will be closed down hopefully and the fish will be fully protected and, and just start working away at it and hopefully uh, at some point mm -hmm. public lands grazing will become a thing of the past. Well, you know, public lands grazing is just a form of welfare, it seems like to me. Well, it is. You may not want to use that term, but it, it is. that's exactly what it yeah. is. Yeah, and also the timber corporations making a killing off public lands as well for corporate profit. These were originally created as uh, Forest Service uh, National Forests because of the rate of overlogging all around them. And then somewhere along the line, probably with the advent of Gifford Pinchot, for, among others. It was the late 1800s, um, I think. Yeah, it started going over towards more logging on the public lands as well. 
and I read a book uh, written by a person in a logging family near the Gifford Pinchot National Forest where it mentioned that the Weyerhaeuser Corporation used to think that a 150-year tree rotation for logging was reasonable, then it went down to 65 years, then to 45. Well, in eastern Oregon, I'm seeing them logging at a rate of 20, every 20 years. That's not sustainable for no. soils or for logging mature trees. It hasn't had a chance to grow back, really. So they end up logging the mature trees that they told the public they would leave in the last sale. And so that's like a zero-sum endgame where you're just going to run out. A slow motion and, clear cut. Yeah, and it's also not doing the local communities any favors because it's not sustainable. We need to look at new ways of making uh, economics work in eastern Oregon, and it's going to be hard, but we need to look at new market niches or something, something different than mm -hmm. continuing to rely on saw logs off the federal lands. Sure, and I know that uh, I, I, I was watching, I think, uh, Rachel Maddow, and she, she asked, had somebody on there that was... Uh, had something to do with what, what happened up there in uh, was it Oso, I think, with the mudslide, mm -hmm. and uh, she asked him if there was any, if it was, if logging had anything to do with it. And he said a small amount, but in the pictures I saw of it, it looked like a lot of that area had been logged over. Oh yeah, and there's uh, been other mudslides attributing, especially to clear cut logging, mm -hmm. which is just barbaric. I, I can't even understand why clear cutting still goes on. Especially when the, 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 the folks that are doing the actual work that are making wages, whereas the big money are going probably, probably out of state, but certainly out of the area, well, and, and, and they're the of, ones that yeah. are in danger. Well, a lot of the big timber corporations have already left eastern Oregon, and then they move on uh, to other places where there's lower labor standards, lower environmental standards, and so forth. Like uh, some of the corporations go to Chile or to Mexico or to Siberia. Mm -hmm. Weyerhaeuser went to Siberia. I think Boise Cascade was logging in probably Mexico and also Chile, if I remember mm -hmm. right. Uh, Interfor just sent up shop out there. I don't quite understand why, but in other words, it's getting down to more local mills and local contractors, which at least gives you room for dialogue because these are people who want to continue to live in the area. So uh, there are collaborative groups out there, and, and from my point of view, it's um, pretty heavily weighted towards timber industry and uh, historically timber-dependent local communities. Uh, there's not that many environmentalists, but nonetheless, at least we're able to talk and see if we can find any common ground. Yeah, because that's basically, you know, that's, that's what has to be done. I mean, there was a, a, a woman called Judy Berry that was able to get to get common ground between the loggers right. and the and the union people and the environmentalists. Yeah. And uh, we Judy you know, was phenomenal. And, and you know what happened to her is there was a car bomb blew up in her car and they they tried to get say that she was the one that was responsible for it. Mm -hmm. And eventually, after so many years, the lawsuits you know came out and, and unfortunately she di had died along the way of. Uh, of uh, some kind of cancer, breast cancer, breast cancer, and uh, but the the uh, lawsuit went through, and there was a large couple million dollars or something. Yeah, it was a historic win against the FBI for violating their civil and rights. Oakland police, is that right? And the Oakland right? police, yeah. Yeah, and I just bring that up because that that is you know sometimes that's what happens to people who are effective. Right. You know, and, and, and that is what is needed, though, because that is the most dangerous thing to, to the folks that are wanting to extract the resources at whatever cost to the people who live there. Uh, they'll go to no, they'll stop at nothing. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very concerned about the increasing threat to our civil liberties uh, with things like the so-called Patriot Act, and the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. And if people are interested in working against those things, they should support the Civil Liberties Defense Center in Eugene, in Eugene. which has been very active in defending activists and also uh, creating good case law against acts like that, trying to uh, stop the surveillance and stop the encroachment on our civil liberties. Mm -hmm. uh, it's getting more and more like a dictatorship by any other name. Right. You know, uh, what do they call it? A uh, velvet fascism or something like something that? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you mentioned uh, the, the folks down there in Eugene, but that, that uh, what was that second law you mentioned? Having the Animal Enterprise Act? Anim well, Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. Basically making it, con people considered terrorists who in any way shut down or stop the profits or impede the profits of animal enterprises, which could be livestock, it could be fur, so-called fur farmers who are mm -hmm. electrocuting mink, uh, for fur coats, 
It could be uh, vivisectionists, um, ripping open primates for study and so forth. A lot of the, the issues that animal rights people are very concerned about because it causes immense suffering to the animals. And of course, there's long been these movements to release animals from fur farms, to release animals uh, from vis vivisectionist type experiments. And so they're trying to crack down and make it a terrorist act to mm -hmm. impede these profits, even if it's for a uh, humane motive. Humane. And I just saw, I think it was state laws in some places, they're passing laws that make it totally against the law, not a terrorism, but against the law to go in there and and uh, without, you know, and, and take video without them yeah, knowing it. The, you know, they're making the other, that against the law. There was a Portland resident who was very successful in uh, getting a job at, uh, I think it was the Oregon Primate Center. Right, and, and Matt yeah. yeah, Matt Rizal, and, and exposing what was happening behind closed doors there that the public wasn't aware of yeah. and protesting it. And that's where that kind of law comes about is you get effective and yep. you start it, having a crackdown exactly, against yeah, you. Like the Judy Berry, you know, if mm -hmm. you're effective, something happens. So, yeah. but uh, you know, we're kind of wandering around, but we're not really wandering around because we're talking about related. we're talking about the same thing. And I know mm -hmm. I like, that's what I like to do is connect, connect these different dots because a viewer might be watching and they may have this particular interest. They may have that particular interest, but mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, with, with the power of the corporations and the dangers that are being daily being maximized to our to our democracy, they're, they're becoming increasingly connected. Whether it's you know GMOs or it's, or it's mm -hmm. a free trade or whatever, we're all talking about the, the same the same players. And ultimately, what we need as a society and culture is a biocentric or ecocentric ethic where humans are recognized to be just one species among many and we need to make sure we're not impeding on the right of other species to flourish and survive and that's ultimately for our own benefit too i mean look at the disintegration of capitalism and industrial uh, pollution of the earth to the point where problems are now global like uh, fukushima radiation of the ocean uh, bluefin tuna showing up at california ports with strontium 90, 90 in them, uh, highly radioactive. Uh, the climate change going spinning out of control uh, that can create famines and mass emigrations mm -hmm. and the extinction of species like the polar bear and the pika, um, mass problems with both humans with floods and super storms and with uh, species not able to keep up with the changes. Uh, we can't continue along this industrial capitalist corporate rule pathway. It's just not a viable future. So mm -hmm. we have to uh, go back to more of an indigenous worldview where nature is sacred. We have to have respect for it. We have to give back to it. And we have to reduce our consumption and mm -hmm. ultimately, gradually, reduce the human population as well. But especially the rate of fossil fuel consumption and just the out-of-control consumerism in general. Mm -hmm. Global pillage is destroying a global village. Yeah, <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it doesn't have to be that way. We could start localizing and decentralizing and turning to renewable energy and so forth. Sure. You know, we... we 1970s when we started getting the big problems and the long gas lines we started moving in the direction of of uh of uh alternate energy and i think mm -hmm. jimmy carter put on uh solar panels on this white house that were taken down by ronald reagan that right. we were starting to do that yeah. and if we'd have spent time and money and efforts then we we could probably have it set up to now that the technology could be in place where people could generate the electricity for their house at their house. Yeah, they well, could decentralize it to the point where you're not needing mm -hmm. these big central multi-billion dollar companies. Yeah, well, the, the solutions are all out there. It just takes the political will to put them in place. I mean, there's political will on the part of some cor uh, comp <laughs> get all mixed up now between companies and nations on the part of some nations not much difference. <laughs> <laughs> on the part of some nations to deal more effectively with slowing down climate change which is already in force is already past the worst scenario that I saw in 1990 when I was studying it when I was reading the science it's already way past that we have to slow it down we we can't even stop it at this point and then there's other nations like the US that don't seem to be willing to deal with it and we're responsible for putting on the pressure to make sure that it is dealt with uh, by our own country. Um, and of course, we're fighting an uphill battle against corporate power because corporations are pretty much running this country mm -hmm. and running the world internationally 
uh, with transnational corporate power and leveraging. Running and ruining both. Yeah. So we could go on forever, and I'd love to do that, but, but uh, we're down to less than four minutes, so mm -hmm. we want to get back to a Blue Mountain Biodiversity Project. The work that you do over there is very important, even though folks over here don't know about it. And, you know, I mean, not well, that they don't now know. They do. <laughs> now they know about it, but they don't see it, you yeah. know. And it's important that uh, they can go to their website there and find out what, the, what it is that you're doing and, uh, and, and how important it is. You know, there's a question I always like to ask folks that, uh, that are involved in this. You know, um, why save species? But even more important, why is wilderness important to people who live in a city that never get out there? Well, I think that we're having stunted lives when we're confined to cities because cities are polluted, human-made environments. I feel very restless and wanting to go back home to Eastern Oregon when I'm in Portland, even though Portland is a good city as they go and a lot of good people trying to do good things. But nonetheless, it's a human-made environment. It's not a natural ecosystem. And so when I'm really antsy to go in the spring, People say, why? It's so beautiful here. And yes, there's all kinds of flowers, and it is beautiful to bike through, but it's not a natural spring. It's not wildflowers. It's not plants responding to, to natural diversity and niches. And I think people lose a lot spiritually in a sense of wholeness, and I think they lose the ability to survive once the system collapses if they get too far removed from natural cycles. Mm -hmm. I think rural people have a much better sense of what it takes to survive in the wild than people in the cities. And I think one way of experiencing that and getting more in touch with what the real world is, it's not virtual reality, it's not cell phones and texting and email and uh, internet and Twitter and all that. The real world is out there and waiting to be explored and it can be a really life-changing experience to spend some time in wilderness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, we need to be able to do that as well as the spe other species needing it, we need it too. Mm -hmm. And even though you're living in the city and you're, you don't, you're not connected to that, at least, you know, consciously, you are. I mean, that, that, that is going on out there and so much of our lives depend upon that process continuing, yeah. whether or not you are directly interfaced with it. Well, for instance, forests are pretty much the lungs of the earth. They take mm -hmm. in carbon dioxide and they release oxygen. If we cut down too many forests, we're definitely speeding up climate change. Everything's interrelated. If you cut down too many forests, you lose a lot of your hydrologic processes that provide That's uh, a really good point. Uh, communities with water. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't cut your own throats by doing in nature, basically. You can't, uh, nature is not committing ecocide, humans are mm -hmm. committing ecocide, and we need to recognize that we have to reverse that. Yeah, like, well, when Donald Duke said that, you know, human, nature, human beings are at war with nature, and uh, it may not be a declared war, but it's definitely a war. Oh, because, yes. Because I really it, like when Donald Duke, yeah, what she, she says. She has a lot to say, so we're down to lesson, you know, you got to parting gift here for folks? We're well, down to I like 40 seconds. I just <laughs> hope people will get involved. Mm -hmm. Check out our website. Uh, call me up, 541-385-9167 if you'd like to volunteer or donate, or you can donate through the website. And also let me know if you want to be on our email action list for uh, commenting and showing public opposition to some of these projects. Right, and the projects are going on all around us, whether it's Mount Hood, whether it's the coast. The coast has been ravaged, and uh, and, and, and then that's going on in Central Oregon as well, in yeah. Eastern Oregon. So And get well, involved, yeah. You have to get involved. There's so many ways to do that, and uh, there'll be a lot of folks out there that tell you ways to do it. So we're down to the end here. Thanks for watching. Like it just Thank popped you. up. Thanks to the crew.